What's up, New Hope family? Welcome to New Hope here. Welcome to the lobby. My name is David. I'm our online campus director. I'm so excited that you've joined us today. It's going to be such a great day, some great worship, a great message. Um, but before that, this is just the lobby, and we just kind of hang out before the service gets started like you would if you were in a lobby. <gasps> Ooh. That's why we call it the lobby. With me today is my friend Olivia. Hi, guys. Hi, Olivia. It's been Hello. a few weeks. We haven't had you on the lobby. It's, it's nice good to, to be have here. you back. Michael, it hasn't been a few weeks. You've been. I was in this spot last you week. You were on producer cam last week. Michael's Sweet. on producer cam. I love the producer cam. I think one of our best additions to the lobby was producer cam. I think so. Mm, it just, definitely. you know, I get sick of hearing myself talk. So having a third person here really kind of. Yeah, I'm nice. probably not the third person you want then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't say much. <laughs> when you add something, it's dynamite. That's, right. it's like, That's what I'm going for. Like I've coached kids before where they're like <laughs> they're leaders on the team, but they're not vocal. You know, like that. So when they do speak up and say something, it like really is impactful because they're like, oh my word. You know, That's Leif Larson it. just yelled at us to work harder. Like we should probably mm -hmm. work harder. Shout out to Leif Larson. Miss you. Uh, f he was a new hoper as yeah. well, and I coached him in basketball. Hey, Leif. I didn't and he was him. he was a classic like lead by example kid yep. mm. and he didn't say much but like one or two okay. times in his very Scandinavian way he'd yep. let people know we needed to work harder or something yeah. and it's impactful because when you talk all the time sometimes okay. it just, no that was me <laughs> not you oh, <laughs> she just assumed she just assumed it was about her that's great <laughs> Yes, we I should just end the lobby there. That was as good as it's going <laughs> to yeah. get. Have a good time. No. Olivia, it's great to have you here. It's been great to, yeah, take a little break from you guys. Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, you Whoa. did You did take a little break. You wandered off to, to faraway lands yeah, for a few days. all the way to Texas. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That was um, exciting. I learned how to say yeehaw. <laughs> and I got good to... Good thing you went. <laughs> yeah. yeah <this. laughs> But that's it. Worthwhile trip. <laughs> no, we got to uh, we got to go to a special edition of the Global Leadership Summit. Oh my word! Which is a leadership conference that yes. we host, and I uh, got to see Craig Rochelle. I don't know if you guys are know his, him. Are but his muscles as big in person as they appear on camera? Um, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> that's a yes. Pretty simple answer. That's a, yeah. <laughs> Yes yeah, or no. they are. And he's sadly, it was... The, he's still the strongest pastor in all the land. I'm just going to say this. You know, when we landed there, it was 76 degrees, T-shirt weather. And then all of a sudden, it went down to 50 the next day. So he had like a jacket on or something? Very sad about That's it. disappointing. Yeah. That's <laughs> other than like, you know, great preaching, excellent leadership, yeah. and incredible ministry. <laughs> the most identifying factor after that are Craig Groeschel's biceps. That's true. And like Albert Tate loves to make jokes about them every single year. Right. At mm -hmm. the and Albert Tate was there. Did he make a joke about Craig Rochelle's biceps? He didn't because we couldn't see, you couldn't see them. <laughs> <laughs> I think so when I was growing up, uh, Jesse Ventura became the governor of Minnesota. Michael, you may remember this. I do. Um, you definitely would not remember nope. it. You probably weren't alive yet at that point. Michael <laughs> and I are old. Um, but it, Jesse Ventura was a professional wrestler. Okay. And then an actor. Uh, who became the governor of Minnesota. They called him the governator. Um, oh. And uh, everything else aside, there were lots of bumper stickers at the time that would say, my governor can beat up your governor. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> and I feel like if I went to life.church in Oklahoma City, <laughs> I would need a bumper sticker that said, my pastor yes. can beat up your pastor. <laughs> <laughs> at least a shirt. Just with, like, oh, just with yes. Craig Groeschel's bicep yeah. on there. I feel like, yeah, I or a shirt. I need that. Do you think he would like it if I wore that to his church? Probably not. No, probably not. Anyway. <laughs> I feel like it'd be kind of weird. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you got to go. Did you learn some cool stuff? Yeah, some really good things. Yeah. The Global Leadership Summit's pretty cool. It's if you've never attended awesome. that before, either, in, you know, well, not in person, in person, but it's like there is an in-person conference, and then there's mm -hmm. just like a bajillion host sites, which mm -hmm. is what our Williston campus has been. But there's also ways to, to join online. Yeah. That definitely ramped up during COVID, as most things yeah. did yeah, <laughs> online. Correct. Like we this. <laughs> Welcome to New Hope Here. <laughs> cool. <clears throat> yes. We had, yeah, it was quite the different setup. Th three, three, it's, has it been, it's almost been three yeah. years since that. Three years in March. Wow. Wow. Which also means I've almost worked here for three years. Yeah. Which that is, is almost crazy. scarier. That is scary. Three years. Which, again, also means the lobby is almost three years That's old. That's right. What is this, 140? 145. Yeah, this 145. is 145. Shout out again to our super fans. <laughs> Thank you for counting for us. Amazing. <laughs> we definitely would not have done that. <laughs> nope. <laughs> and I'm so glad that you did it. This is 145. So yeah, in five episodes, we're going to do something. Yeah. 
You were the original producer. I was. You helped plan a lot of the original gags. Correct. And, and bits. And celebrations. And celebrations. And celebrations, yeah. The Five Timers Club, the original Five Timers Club with Aaron, and then all the following Five Those Timers. Those were my favorites. <coughs> that was a good time. Amazing. That was a good time. I hope, I hope you've been with us long enough that you know what we're talking about. Otherwise, right. you're like, what's happening right now? But when if does you don't church know what start? When does about, church start? I'm glad you're here. Michael, how many? Oh, man. There's a t My phone fell asleep. There's probably a timer four on the and a half minutes. Yeah, so there's a timer on cool. the screen letting you know how long this will go for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> hey, I want everybody that's here right now, um, not everybody joins us early to hang out on the lobby, but if you do, jump in the chat right now. Please. And say hello. That's it. Like, it, it's that easy. There's, other, there's people in the chat right now that want to talk to you. I am probably one of them. You often I are one of them. I want to chat with you. So let's, I'm going to go ahead and say that you're going to be there. Yeah, I will. So Olivia yeah. and I are in the chat. If you're not a good typer, you can just say hi. That's I was literally Yeah, hi is easier than hello. <laughs> yep. <laughs> if you don't want to type hello. Yeah. <laughs> Save yourself a whole bunch of letters. Just like, type hi. Speaking of Pastor Aaron, if you type like him. Oh. <laughs> you know what? I think we My could dad even, types like that, yeah. too. We could even go as far as saying, like, they could just post a hand emoji that just... Ooh. I'm okay with a hand emoji. I think we can go there. Yep, I'm okay with a hand okay. emoji. So, so what, post yeah. those hands. Whether you're on YouTube or church online, just yeah. just say what's up. We just want to talk Some, with you. You can say what's up. You can say howdy. You can did yeah. you learn howdy? You can say yeehaw <laughs> if you really want to. It. If you're hanging out with Olivia in Texas, you can say yeehaw. Yeah. Apparently. You did a you did a young person thing while you were in Texas. As an old person, if I was on like a work trip. I wouldn't like randomly on the last night be like, let's see if we can find the, yeah, th tickets to this concert or this cool it was actually Christian artist amazing. that's playing where we're staying. I'd have been like, I'm going back to the hotel. Yeah. We were hanging and out in sleeping. Dallas downtown and we were just kind of like, let's see if there's this anything going on. This is young person activity. And uh, there was a sold out show to Drew and Ellie Holcomb and we were like, um, can we go to that? And we found two tickets that were like just resell, laying on the ground. Like, oh, okay. Like someone was reselling them and so we bought them and nice. like, was it that, a good this show? This was two hours before the concert, and we were like, "What's?" Was this? it a good show? Amazing. I would, I would love to see them. It was and I saw that picture of you guys. Phenomenal. And like, did they actually go to that? <laughs> yeah. And I was kind of mad. We did. It was. <coughs> oh my gosh, it was. So, they're and they're just like such a like beautiful couple too. To yeah. Just watch together. I mean, like I, I love a good concert, but again, like it's my work trip. I want to go to my hotel room that yeah. I probably didn't have to pay for. Eat dinner that I probably didn't probably have to pay for smart and that sleep. We went. No, it oh. absolutely was smart. We were out when I was really late. Olivia, I'm oh. not going to age you, but I'm significantly older than you, mm -hmm. as we discussed. A governor I remember was governor before you were born. Uh, <laughs> when I was your age, I would have done the same yeah. thing. Yeah. I'm just an old curmudgeon it now. It was a good move. It's just the concert ended four hours before we had to like leave for oh, the airport. Oh yeah, that would have been a that maybe wasn't a good <laughs> move. <laughs> See, I was on board with going until to that concert, part. Until that part. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that would have been a tough decision. How, how much time do we have left, Michael? Uh, worth it. Just under two minutes. Okay. Favorite, first concert and favorite concert you've ever been to? Oh, oh my gosh. Uh, I think it was like a winter jam type concert that I went to where okay. like all of like the Christian artists came to like our local college mm -hmm. and uh, or university and like watched it. And that was probably my first concert. Okay. And then favorite concert was probably Vance Joy. Uh, oh, nice. And he, I like Vance Joy. In California. No. And Washington, D.C. Nice. Washington, D.C. I just love him. Michael? <laughs> I think I'm pretty sure my first concert was Petra. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Here in Williston at the Agri Sports Complex. Amazing. Amazing. I was like seventh grade, maybe <laughs> sixth grade. Amazing. I had no idea who they were. Uh, and then my favorite, I had. I grew up a Garth Brooks fan, and I got to go see him in Vegas one time, and that's it was cool. fantastic. Well, that's and enough so country. It was on his talk. tour, not when he was like in <laughs> Vegas. <laughs> that's enough country. Yeah, obviously I'm, I knew I don't all care if the you guys Brooks. care or not, but I love Garth that's Brooks. Amazing. That's amazing. I love that for you. Fantastic concert. My, <clears throat> my first concert, well, I don't count my first concert as my first concert because Big Fat Jam played at St. Rita's Catholic Church up the road from my house, and I did go to that, oh. I believe, first, but I, I don't count that. Uh, I went and saw Reliant K. Yeah. Uh, when they were like a nobody, they had just released their self-titled album, um, and Ace Troubleshooter, which Ooh, was a local yeah. punk band in the Twin Cities, but they were they were more regional than local, uh, opened for Reliant K, and I was in the front row, in the mosh pit the whole time. Amazing. It was the, it's also probably the best concert I've ever been to. It was great. incredible. But if I picking a different one for best concert, Twenty One Pilots at the XL Energy Center was. Oh, I've never seen a spectacle cool. like that. Yeah. Um, like they they put on such a ridiculous show. So. 
That's really cool. Ten seconds, Michael? Mm -hmm. Ten oh, seconds. Lord. Tell us your favorite concert That's slash first concert in oh. the chat. Jump in the chat. Let us know. First of all, just say hello, because we love you. Olivia and I are in the chat right now waiting yeah. to say hello to you. Hello. Hi. Just in case I didn't write hello right now. But we really do right. want to talk to you in the chat. Let us know your favorite concert you've ever been to, your mm -hmm. first concert. Um, and then uh, we have a great service. It's going to be an awesome time today. Hi. We love you, New Hope family. We're so glad that you're here. And we will see you in just a minute. What's up, New Hope family? Welcome to New Hope here. We are so excited that you've joined us for worship today. We have a great service prepared. Pastor Mike has an awesome message. He's in Esther today. Ooh, it's going to be a really good one. Good. We're in week three of Greater Than, which is our last series in the Old Testament. Guys. I know. That's really sad. It seems weird that we're done with the Old Testament already. We've been here for a long time. We have. But not long enough right. at the same time. Hopefully you've been reading either the story or, or your Bible, reading along with us and our reading plan. Hopefully you've been joining us on the Grow podcast so you've been able to dive a little bit deeper because... Yeah, I think we've been like 20, 21 weeks Something in like the Old that. Testament, yeah. which is not enough to cover, you know, everything yeah. that happens. So hopefully, really yeah, hopefully yeah. you've been joining us. There's one more week next week as well as we wrap up this series, Greater Than. Um, but like I said, it's going to be a great message today. I do want to encourage you to stick around all the way to the very end because Pastor Mike's going to be here after his message and he wants to talk to you. So make sure you stick around for that. Um, but before all of that, we have an incredible time of worship.
fathering the orphan in me. You say I'm your own. I never am alone. I never am alone. You found me and I've made
Well, church, we love being able to worship with you. In just a few minutes, Pastor Mike is going to come out and give the message. Uh, but right now, uh, we want to encourage you, if you have kids, grab a second device, click the link in the chat, and hand that over to them. We have a service that's just for them. So fun. Uh, Pastor Andrea, Pastor Anna, they play a game. Uh, there's some time of worship, and then there's a teaching for them. So, uh, like I said, take a second device, hand that over, and click the link, and it'll take you right there. Yes, and church family, we would love to be able to connect with you. And a great way to do that right now, if you're joining with us live, uh, there is a chat box. I yes. love the chat box. I think I talk about that most weeks. Um, but mostly because we just want to know who's worshiping with us. Yeah. We want to know that you're part of our church family. So if you're joining with us live, I really encourage you, let us know that yes. you're with us, that you're worshiping with us. And maybe us. where they're from. Yeah, that would be fun too, just where you're worshiping from. Maybe if you're working, things like that, just let us know yeah. in that chat just so we can be able to connect with you uh, as we worship together. Also, if you're not joining with us live but you're watching later, we still encourage you to fill out that Connect card. It's a great way for us to stay connected as a church family. Yeah. Uh, if you're looking for ways to get involved at New Hope, also if you have prayer requests, all of that you can put it on your Connect card. Find that on our New Hope app. Yeah, and uh, last week we had our tithing challenge, and so many of you filled out a card, and we just want to know, let, want, want to let you know Pastor Mike is praying for you. And mm. if you didn't get signed up last week, it's not too late. Go to newhopehere.com slash tithe, and you can sign up for that and, uh, and join, join the 90-day challenge. Yeah. Um, but right now we want to continue in worship by giving back to God his tithes and our offerings. And so the, the easiest way to do that is by clicking the link in the chat, or you can go to our website, newhopehere.com slash give. Yes, and church family, we would love to be able to pray for you right now. So I just encourage you, uh, whatever it is that you're doing, let's just take that time to quiet ourselves, uh, to be able just to pray before the Lord. Uh, again, if you're not joining with us live, we would love to pray with you um, by filling out that Connect card. We pray over those every single week. Also, right now, if you feel like there's just something really uh, on your heart that you would love to have prayer for, we have hosts that uh, are with us live. Uh, click the button that's in the chat. That'll take you to a private chat uh, where you can just lift up your uh, prayer request and they'll pray for you right there. But let's pray together. God, thank you for uh, just this day that we get to worship you, this time that is set apart from everything else where we can just come before you and, and sing your praises, sing how uh, you're good to us, the ways that you've showed up for us, Lord. Um, as we sang those words for the last song, God, just speaking about what is true of you. And so we praise you. Uh, this morning, Lord, and we're so grateful for our church family, for the many places that they join us, and uh, how you just invite us to be one community, Father, and um, whether people are in the chat right now or not, Lord, we know that so many people just have uh, things that they need to bring before you, Father, and so we just pray over all of those specific requests, knowing that uh, you are working in those situations, Lord, that you see those situations, uh, and that you love the people who, who just bring those uh, requests before you, Father, and as we think about the message today, Today, God, just to remind us that whatever season we're in, whether we enjoy it or not, or that you have us there for a specific reason and uh, that you are working in that uh, season and in those hard things and those good things, God, that uh, you are always working in those things, Lord. And so I pray whether we see that or not, God, we just still keep our eyes focused on you, uh, what you're doing and how you're moving. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you ever wake up and wonder how the day is going to go? It's like, um, let's roll the dice. Let's see, do, do I get a good roll? Do I get a bad roll? What are the odds today is going to be a good day? What are the odds it's going to be a bad day? Sometimes we, it just feels like the odds are against us, doesn't it? And sometimes it feels like everything is rolling our way. 
There's a feast. It's, in fact, it's one of the great feasts, great holidays on the Jewish I Israel or Hebrew calendar. And those three words mean the same, same, the same group of people. And the feast is called the Feast of Purim. Purim. And the feast actually falls, they still celebrate it today, it falls on March 6th in 2023, just over a week away. And Purim actually comes from the Hebrew word pur, P-U-R, and the word literally means odds or dice, dice. So the feast of Purim could actually be called the feast of odds, the feast of dice. And, and Purim is a great holiday. They eat lots, which is how you know it's a great holiday, right? And they, they give gifts. They give gifts to the less fortunate. And one of the things that they do is they all gather together and they open the Old Testament because that's the scriptures for the Jewish people. And they read one of the books of the Old Testament, one of the books from cover to cover, the book of Esther. And as they read the book of Esther, it's highly interactive. There are certain names that when they hear them, everybody boos and hisses. And there are certain names when they hear them, everybody cheers like, yay, it's, you know, it's, it's the villain and then it's the hero. Can you imagine in church if we do that when there's certain topics, well, boo and hiss. And then there are certain topics when they're great, we all go, yeah, you know, it's great. Maybe we need to read more often. Well, that's the book we're in today. And as we dive in, let's get a lower story perspective. If you've been with us, you know we're reading the Bible from three perspectives because there's always three things happening. The upper story, where's God at work? We'll get there in a moment. The lower, or my story, what does it matter to us? And then lower story. Lower story is where does this actually fit in human history? And since it's a different part of history, are there things that we don't understand today that we need to understand? And where we're at right now is at the end of the times in the kings. We're at the close of the Old Testament days. But a hundred years before the events of Esther, the last two tribes of Israel had been exiled into Babylon. And God had promised them that in 70 years they would get to return. They got to return. And we looked at that last week, and about 50,000 people got to return, not under the empire of Babylon, but during those 70 years, Babylon had been taken over by another empire, the empire of the Medes and the Persians, or the Persians. And King Cyrus had declared that they could go back, and some of them were allowed to go back, some of them chose to stay, some of them could not stay. We talked a couple of weeks ago about Daniel, how he desperately wanted to go back, but stayed and served the enemy, in the enemy's camp week after week after week. And now we're about 30 years after that first group of people had gone back. And the capital of the Persian Empire, at least one of the capitals, was no longer Babylon. It was Susa. Babylon was about 750 miles away from Jerusalem by camel or by walking. Susa was another 200 miles beyond that. It's about 900 miles. And it was here in Susa that the events of Esther take place. It was here where there is still a contingent of the descendants of Abraham and Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel, where some of them moved, some of them still lived, and some of them seemingly by chance felt like all the odds were against them. The story, as it's read, as we said, has different characters in them. And one of the characters that causes everybody to boo and the hiss is a character by the name of, a person by the name of Haman. Haman, it felt like all the dice were falling in, in his favor because he was one of the main advisors, one of the most trusted people for the Persian king of Xerxes. And Haman, we find out, this had this dirty little secret. He hated the Jewish people. By the way, Jewish means of the tribe of Judah, one of the final tribes that was left. And Haman's hatred was especially aimed, it was aimed at all of them, but especially at one person. Mordecai, Mordecai, and Mordecai, the reason he had Haman's hatred and bitterness was because as all of the dice seemed to be falling in Haman's favor, he became an advisor to the king. He became self-important. He wanted everybody to bow down to him, and Mordecai said no. 
I'm not bowing down to you. I only bow to my God. And so Haman already irrationally hated the Jews, hated them even more. And he especially wanted to do away with the one man who didn't honor him the way that he thought he would deserve, Mordecai. And so Haman's hatred just seethed and it boiled until finally he hatched a plan. And, and Haman's plan almost seems irrational. He tricked the king, tricked the king in when he was advising him into signing a law. I kind of picture him slipping some documents in and the king saying, what are these? And, and him just saying, just trust me, king, it's okay, you don't have time. And he signs this law. And the law was saying that at an undisclosed time, Everybody had a chance to purge the empire, like the horrific movies, The Purge, to purge the empire of the Jewish people. And if you, defeat, if you destroyed them, if you killed them as an incentive, you got all of their stuff. And Haman dreamed of the day when he was able to kill Mordecai and own all of Mordecai's stuff. And you think that's kind of extensive, that's kind of irrational. That's kind of, uh, that's kind of extreme, Haman, for, uh, you know, you want to destroy this group of people. Unless you understand the thread, and the thread goes all the way back to about 1050 BC. It was at the very beginning of the times of the kings and the prophets. The kingdom, all 12 tribes of Israel, was under one king. The first king, his name was Saul. And God had told Saul that there was a group of people who he needed to take care of. He needed to take them off the face of the earth. And we go, man, that's extreme. But the Amalekites, as they were called, they were a horrible group of people. They're a group of people who, when they worshiped their gods, they would take their own children and put them in the bronze hands of a statue and light a fire underneath and watch their own children slowly roast and burn and scald to death. And they believed that the screams of their children were worship to their pagan gods. And they refused to allow anybody else in proximity to worship any other god but their gods. They were, they forced themselves upon other people. They were a poison to the earth and God said enough is enough. If they exist, they're going to constantly turn people away from me and so you need to take them out. And Saul did sort of. He said, why take them all out? That seems extreme. And so he left 400, 400 a remnant. And God said, that's going to come back to haunt you. Doesn't haunt Saul. But year after year, as those 400 Amalekites began to disperse and run for their lives, they told the story of the group of people whose God wanted them wiped out. And their hatred went deeper and became more irrational. And they prayed to their gods for the day when the dice would suddenly fall in their favor. And now here was Haman, advisor to the most powerful man on earth, the king of Persia. And he thought the odds are finally in my favor. The law had been signed. The only thing that had to be determined was when everybody could hunt down the Jews and wipe them out. And Haman said, we've been praying for the odds to be in our favor. Now the odds are in our favor. And so he said, let the odds decide. He pulled out the poor, the dice, and he rolled it. And the date was chosen 11 months from then is Adar the 13th on the calendar, which falls somewhere in February and March. Adar the 13th. In 11 months, the Jewish people would be wiped out. That's the beginning of the story. That's the Haman part of the story. And when Haman's name is read, everybody boos and hisses. But the book of Esther records another storyline, and I love stories that have multiple storylines that seem separate, and then they begin to come together and collide. And the story begins with an orphan girl named Esther. She was raised by her cousin, 
And it seemed like with each roll of the dice, Esther and her people, it, th the odds were not in her favor. Her parents die. She's orphaned. She's raised by her cousin. And then uh, a banquet is held in the king's palace. And the queen at the time, the queen Vashti, is called by the king to dance for all of his guy friends. And, and here's the deal with, uh, with the story of Esther. I heard this story when I was in Sunday school for the first time. And they tell this story almost like a romance. And they, and they tell it. But as you dig into the story as an adult, you realize this is not a G-rated story. There's some mature audiences only kind of moments in the story. And this is one of them. The queen didn't want the king to come in or the king didn't want the queen to come in and just kind of dance. He wanted her. He wanted to show off her body to all of his guy friends. And of course, she said, no, I'm not coming in and being the object of everybody's lusts. But here's the deal. Even though she was queen, she had little to no authority unless the king gave it to her. And so she lost all of her authority. She was stripped of her title. He divorced her and she was disowned. She was out. And an edict goes out. That we're going to choose a different queen. And so all of the king's officials went out across the empire and they began gathering together all of the good looking, let's just face it, face it, all of the cute, hot girls in the kingdom. And they pull them all together and they're told, you are now part of the king's harem. The king can call on you into his bedroom anytime he wants. Not a G-rated story. But one of you might, might get the opportunity to be the queen. The rest of you will have the opportunity to be treated well and taken care of, but you'll always be available to the king's bedroom. In fact, they were to be prepared, and if you have your books, page 20, or it's Esther chapter 2, they were to be prepared for the king. And page 278, here's how they were to be prepared for their first meeting to the king. Before a young woman's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and cosmetics. 12 months of spa. That sounds like heaven until you read the next part. And just a little bit down. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace, the king's bedroom, basically. And in the evening, she would go there. And in the morning, return to another part of the harem to the care of Shaskaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of, see it, the concubines the king's sex slaves. So here was Esther, who it felt like every part of her life, the odds were not in her favor. Every roll of the dice, she lost her parents. She was raised by her cousin. Now she gets pulled into basically sex slavery to a sex-crazed king who had hundreds of women's, women to pull from. You get the picture? Get the picture? Haman's story. He hates the Jews. There's Esther's story. But as you read Esther's story, she goes into the king and something about her caught the king. And he chooses her above all of the other women to become the queen. She was beautiful. She was chosen. There was something there. And finally, the roll of the dice seemed to go in her favor. And here she is, Queen Esther. But what the book goes of Esther goes to great points or great pains to point out, Esther had never revealed her ancestry. She never revealed that she was of Jewish descent. The only one who knew that she was of Jewish descent, and here's where Haman's story and Esther's story collide. The only one who knew she was of Jewish descent was her cousin. Guess what his name was? Mordecai. The guy that Haman wanted dead above all the others. Esther becomes queen, and it's now three months 
of the 11 months that are slowly ticking by towards Adar the 13th. In nine more months, the results of the dice would happen when Haman thought his people would finally get their revenge. And Mordecai hears about the plot and he calls Esther and he tells her about the law. And her response is, what am I to do about it? No one can change the king's law and I can't. I'm the queen. The last time the queen told the king that he was wrong, she stopped being the queen. In fact, she tells, she tells Mordecai, when Mordecai says, you need to go and change the king's mind. It's on the bottom of page 281. She says to Mordecai, all the king's officials, this is her talking to her cousin, and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to the king. Okay, let's get our lower story perspective here. So in the law of the Medes and the Persians, no one, part of it for the protection of the king, no one could go into the king's presence, including the queen, without the king first calling them. If you were to come into the king's presence without being summoned, it was at risk, at peril of your life, even the queen. And then Esther adds this little caveat that there was no way Haman could know. By the way, it's been a month. It's been a month since I was called to the king's bedrooms. Not a G story, is it? He's got hundreds, maybe thousands of other women for his bedroom. And evidently, I'm no longer his favorite. So how in the world could I change his mind? It would risk my life. And then Mordecai, Mordecai challenges her with words that are the hinge point of the whole story. Top of page 282, he says to her as his queen and as his cousin, Do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows? But that you have come to the royal position, did you catch this? For such a time as this. Esther, you feel like all the dice aren't rolling against you, like none of the dice will roll in your favor. But maybe, maybe... It's not about the dice. Maybe it's not about the odds. Maybe God still is the author of the story. That even when we feel like the odds are against us, there's actually someone behind the scenes. It's not about luck. It's not about odds. It's not about fate. It's not about chances. There is a God, our God, who is at work. And this is... The upper story moment, the upper story truth for Esther. Because this is where God's at work, where she shifts from wondering, is it about whether the odds are in my favor? Or is there a truth, a truth that she could trace in the scriptures, the same truth we've traced all the way to the beginning? There is a God who is always at work and always involved. When it feels like all I roll is snake eyes, God's still there. I may not be able to see him, but he hasn't given up the keyboard of the story. And so Esther says, all right, I'll go. And she says, even if I die, I'm going to trust God's faithfulness. And so she goes. She goes into the king, and I picture this moment. The doors open up. She holds her breath. There's this moment where the whole hall falls silent. Someone has come before the king without being summoned. Oh, it's the queen. Will she become another casualty of the king's whims? And the king, something about her catches his eye. And he extends the symbol of his authority to her. And he says, Queen Esther, I love you. You can have anything you want up to half my kingdom. 
I picture this moment. Maybe it's a little bit like the moment when Kylie walks into my office and I turn to her and say, oh, you're here. I love you so much. You can have anything I want up to half of my kingdom. And of course, she rolls her eyes. I already own, all, I already own it all anyway. <laughs> but you catch what's happening here? This is Esther saying, I'm no longer controlled by the dice. What everybody else thinks, the dice have been rolled for our death. I'm going to trust that there's a God writing the story. He's still involved. That's the upper story. And she answers the king when he says, what do you want? And she invites the king, you'll read about it, to a private dinner. And she says, I want you and just your trusted advisor. Haman, everybody boo, everybody hiss, right? Haman hears about it and full of himself, he was excited that, he, that things seemed to be going his way again. And it's an opportunity to speed up getting rid of Mordecai since he's got the queen on his side and now the king on his side, just a private audience. Maybe he would get close and he would be able to speed up, even, before, even though it's nine months away, speed up getting rid of Mordecai. So in the meantime, he builds this pole about 75 feet high and he plans to ask the king for permission to have Mordecai in pay on it for him to hang there the rest of the nine months until the rest of the Jewish people can be wiped out. And he's thinking, this is my moment. He's invited to the dinner. He's invited to the dinner. And everything goes his way. And he thinks, next morning, next morning, I'm going to ask the king. But what are the odds? That night, the king can't sleep. And in an effort to go to sleep. He calls his advisors to read to him the books of history. That'll put him to sleep. And he reads an account about a plot to assassinate the king, him. And he asks, who was responsible for thwarting the plot, for saving his life? And it happens to be, what are the odds? A guy by the name of Mordecai. So the next morning, he calls Haman in, and Haman thinks, this is my chance. I'm going to ask for Mordecai to be impaled on, on the pole. But the dice don't roll in his favor. The king says, let me tell you about a plot. Let me tell you, who, let me tell you about the fact that someone saved my life. Haman, who do you think should be honored? How do you think that that person should be honored? And Haman, thinking it was him, describes this. This person should be paraded through the streets and everybody should shout honor to this person, honor this person. And the king says, that's a great idea. The man that you are going to honor on your horse, Haman, is Mordecai. And Haman is humiliated. And he hates Mordecai even more. And the resentment and the revenge go deeper. And then the second dinner happens and Haman's invited again. His hopes are revived until the queen tells the king about a plot. A plot to kill her family and her people. And the king is outraged and he asks who's behind it. And in the Silence of that moment, Haman trembles and the finger is pointed and the king gets up, outraged and frustrated. His most trusted advisor had hatched a plot to kill his king. That's what he thought. And Haman gets up to beg for his life. And what are the odds? He trips and he falls on top of Queen Esther, just as what are the odds? <laughs> the king walks in. And the king sees him in his mind trying to take advantage of his wife. And so he orders Haman executed and he asks how he should be executed. And somebody points out, hey, there's a pole waiting for someone to be impaled. So Haman is impaled on the pole that he meant for Mordecai. And the next day Mordecai is raised into Haman's place and gets all of Haman's wealth instead of Haman getting Mordecai's wealth. And then Mordecai goes to the king and says, what are we going to do about this plot? And in the laws of the Persians, laws can't be repealed. So instead they say, here's the deal. When people come to kill the Jews, you can defend yourselves with anything that's possible. You have nine months to prepare. And so they do. And Adar the 13th comes and they defend themselves. 75,000 people come for their children, their lives, and their possessions. And all of the 75,000 people are defeated and killed 
and not one Jewish person's life is lost. And that's the story of Esther. So let's go from Esther's story to my story. It's an underdog story, right? And who doesn't like an underdog story? The orphan becomes the queen, the person that, that everyone thought was going to be defeated, <laughs> won the day. I want to ask the question, because the my story question is, how does this matter to us? And here's the question. What's your Adar the 13th? What has you scared right now? Is there anything? What's keeping you up at night? Where are you wondering where God is? Where does it feel like the dice aren't rolling your way? And if you have a Dar the 13th happening in your life right now where you're just waiting for the dice to roll and no, they aren't going to go your way, I don't need to list examples. You've been thinking of it all along. There's a truth about the book of Esther that you may not have noticed and read it again this week. Here it is. I'll put it here on the screen. God is not mentioned anywhere in the book of Esther, but that doesn't mean he isn't at work and involved. We already talked about that in the upper story. And even though he's not mentioned, it doesn't mean that he's not at work. doesn't mean that his plan isn't still moving forward. Because on the day of the defeat of all of those who are coming against the Jews, Mordecai, with the king's permission, declared a feast. And you want to guess what the feast was called? The Feast of Dice. When the world thought that the dice were declaring our death, God had a different story. Book of Proverbs says this, We may throw the dice, but the Lord determines how they fall. It's Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17 in the New Testament says that all of the Old Testament feasts are given as a preview, as a shadow of what Jesus would fulfill and bring all of the pieces together. And that includes the Feast of Purim. The Feast of Purim is saying, sin rolled the dice and ordered the day of our death, but God turned what everybody thought were the odds against us into a victory. And think about this, Jesus on the cross. It appeared to be the moment when everything was lost, when the dice had been rolled and God had sent his son but sin and Satan had won. Sin killed him. Satan killed the Son of God. Sin rolled the dice and he ordered the day of death. But God turned the cross into the greatest victory in all of the history of eternity. And here's the deal. And this is where we want to land in my story. See, we as human beings, we have kind of different ways of reacting to the world's events when we feel like stuff isn't going our ways, when, when stuff isn't going our way. Think about this. When, when sometimes you feel like the, the dice are going, uh, aren't going your way, sometimes we act in panic, sometimes in anger, sometimes we want to fight back, sometimes we hide, sometimes we give up. And the reason we do that often is because we feel like the dice, the world is spinning out of our control. Even as Christians, we do this. We feel like something is stopping God's storyline, that, that the keyboard that God is typing the story with has somehow been hijacked, and we've got to fight for it. We, we've got to seize control of it. But you know, there's another way of seeing the world. And that's with the conviction that God hasn't handed the keyboard over to anybody, that no one has hijacked it, that he's still the author. Sin has certainly thrown in some twists and some plots and some unexpected moments that God did not want to happen. But God didn't step back and go, oh, now where's the story going to go? God, it, it didn't even cause him to pause. In fact, all of the stuff that sin has thrown at him, all of the times the dice have rolled and appeared to be snake eyes, God is saying, no, 
This story is too big to mess up. Instead, he's the author, and with masterful creativity, with omnipotent power, and with love beyond our explanation, he lets our brokenness, he lets the moments when it feels like all the odds are against us become part of the story, and he turns it into something amazing. So here's where we're going to close. On the third week of our last four weeks in the Old Testament, we're going to ask the question, what's your Adar the 13th? Whatever it is, you're, you're afraid because you feel like everything is lost. But listen, once you understand who the author is, maybe instead of panic, you can ask the question that comes from Mordecai's words to Esther. God, how do you want me to respond for such a time as this? Because if I'm here now in what feels like an Adar the 13th moment, I'm here for a reason, not to panic, not to be afraid, but to partner with you for a lost world. And here's the My Story Challenge. We've talked about 21 days of prayer. We talked about the tithing challenge. Here's this week's challenge. It's not as succinct, but here it is. I'm going to choose to say that when the odds are against me, I choose to believe that God is at work in such a time as this. I'm going to wake up every morning when I feel like the dice are going any way but my way and say, the dice don't matter. God's got the keyboard. God's writing the story. That parenting challenge that is painful, and let's not pretend. Parenting can be painful sometimes, right? When you have that prodigal child, that strong-willed child, instead of giving it up, instead of saying they're on their own, we pray, God, I don't know how you're in this. I don't know how you're going to turn this into good, but I know your will. I know you will. So God, how do you want me to join you for such a time as this? In the middle of a crazy economy, God, I don't know what the future looks like, but you do, and you aren't scared. So how do you want me to respond in such a time as this? An unexpected major life change. A job change, a job career, a job offer. And you're going, God, why now? How would this work? Or maybe God has said, I want you to make this move. And you go, God, this makes no sense. Instead of stepping back and saying, God, no. Maybe we say, God, the reason I'm here right now is for such a time as this. What if, what if we faced events like the global pandemic with a different perspective? Instead of running around and crying and saying, if we don't fight, it'll be the end of the church. What if we say, God, you may or may not have wanted this. Doesn't matter. Because you haven't given up the keyboard. And you're going to use this. In fact, I believe he has used this to be one of the greatest moments in our lifetime. And the reason you and I are here is to experience it and be part of it for such a time as this. So here's our challenge this week. Are we going to say, God, when the odds are against me, I choose to believe that God is at work for such a time as this and say, God, sign me up. I want to be a part. Just a few weeks, we're going to celebrate Easter. We're going to celebrate Easter online. We're going to celebrate it in person. And God will give you an opportunity to invite someone to experience it with you online or in person. And in that moment, you're going to be tempted to say, maybe my invitation doesn't matter. And listen, the reason God puts you there is for such a time as this. It could be an eternal difference. So let's live new hope for such a time as this. God, help us to be bold people, to be courageous people, to be calm people. Because if we're here and following you, there's a reason. And we're here for such a time as this. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, Noah family, I wanted to step in and place the host team to share with you some news that affects us as a New Hope family. I imagine that moment when Mordecai and Esther, we just talked about that, were talking about the decision she was facing and how difficult a decision it was. And everybody else thought she had risen to this place because all of the odds were in her favor, but they knew that God had prepared her for such a time as this. 
And God calls all of us to those moments, kind of crossroads moments where he said, I prepared you for something new and it may not be easy. Pastor Kylie and I have been in one of those moments recently. And I've been nominated to be the next district superintendent of what's called the Pacific Southwest District of the Wesleyan Church. And that's a mouthful, I know. But basically what it means is I've been asked to be kind of the coach and encourager and leader for about 70 churches in the Southwest region of the United States. And bottom line, what that means is if everything goes forward the way that we expect it to go forward, Kylie and I will be stepping away from leadership of New Hope sometime this summer. And that news, I know for all of us, it hits with a range of emotions. For us, it hits us, we feel like part of our heart has been ripped out because New Hope, your family. We love being your pastor. We have loved walking alongside of you and watching Jesus work in all of our lives. And we've loved watching him take this vision and move it forward over the last 12 years. And we've been grieving, honestly, in this process. There's another part of this that has the other side of the emotions, anticipation and expectation. Because anytime you say yes to the Lord's calling and we have heard his voice crystal and abundantly clear. You know that he is getting ready to do for everybody more than we ask or imagine. So we are convinced that God has great things in store for the future of New Hope and great things in store for the Pacific Southwest District. Our local board, our elder team is already well on the way of processing and working through the handoff of the baton to the person who will succeed me down the road and they'll be communicating more in the coming days. But I know for a lot of us, this news hits us and maybe we weren't expecting it. Uh, Kylie and I have had some time to process this and as well as some of those closest to us. So we would ask that you would pray with us, pray with us through this process, pray for new hope. And then we would ask that you would continue to move forward like we talked about in the story of Esther with the expectation that God is still writing our story and he has a place for all of us. And the ministry of New Hope now has the opportunity to expand and be part of a church planting movement as you send us out in the coming months in ways that we never anticipated. Now, you may have questions and I understand that. I would love to be able to sit down one-on-one -on -one with everybody, but that's just not possible, is it? And so David and I recorded a special edition of the Grow Podcast. And today there'll be an email going out with a link to that Grow Podcast. And he asks me the questions that you probably want to ask. And we just process that together. It's not a scripted podcast. He catches me kind of in some of the raw moments as I've been walking through this. And it's just a little bit like us sitting across the table together. So I would ask that you would take some time to uh, to watch that, to listen to that, uh, wherever you watch or listen to the podcasts on YouTube or Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And I wanna encourage you to come back next week as we close out this series and get ready to step into the New Testament. It is no accident that we are where we are in the series. God knew what was coming for us, even though we may not. And next week we're gonna talk about as we end our series in the Old Testament and get ready to go into the New Testament and how to rebuild what's been broken in our lives. And I know out of this, some of us may feel just that. So join us next week. New Hope, if you hear nothing else, please hear that Kylie and I love you. We love being your pastors. And this has been a difficult time and a difficult decision but also a decision that we know God is in. And when God leads, it's always the best thing for all of us. So let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I wanna thank you so much for your leadership, for your love, and for preparing us as a church for this moment. We ask for your wisdom, we ask for your comfort, we ask for your help in the coming days. We know that you are the author of our stories. And so right now, we surrender ourselves to you and say, God, lead us the way that you want to lead us. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.